thanks for coming, everyone. So let's get started. Um, welcome to the seventh Compass Lecture of our fall 2023 semester. Today we have Kyle Ritchie talking. Um, Kyle Ritchie is a fourth year grad student in the physics department advised by Professor Nomura. He completed his undergraduate degree in physics and pure mathematics in 2020 at the University of New Mexico in his hometown, Albuquerque. His area of research is quantum gravity. In particular, he uses ideas from quantum information theory to study the physics of black holes via holographic duality. So um, let's welcome our speaker. Hello. So yeah, uh, I'll be talking about the, the things that you said I'll be talking about, uh, basically black holes and their connection to quantum information. And uh, I guess um, the sort of path that we'll go through things here is, is, is uh, sort of with the aim of, of arguing that space time and gravity are sort of an emergent uh, property of, uh, of uh, this sort of like macroscopic properties of some uh, more fundamental system. So by that, what I mean is like uh, in the way that like thermodynamics describes, uh, you know, the how macroscopic properties of the system are related to each other, but how those rules are kind of emergent from like, you know, the microscopic dynamics of, of particles. Uh, so we sort of talk about how gravity is a similar sort of thing. Um, okay, so some some basic motivation. Uh, I guess maybe before I, I say motivation, I should say that uh, I did a really poor job of including like uh, citations and things uh, in the slides. Uh, if you guys want to know about you know who came up with any of these ideas and stuff, I can I can give more info about that later. But, uh, yeah, sort of cardinal sin of uh, being a grad student, I guess, is uh, not not citing sources. But uh, anyway, so some motivation, uh, gravitational forces are described classically. So uh, outside of quantum mechanics, it's really classically by Einstein's equations. Uh, this is Einstein's equations, the left-hand side, uh, R and G describe, you know, the geometry of space times, the, uh, the curvature and the metric tensor, not important things. The important thing is that they're, uh, they're geometric objects. And then the right-hand side, this T describes the matter content. Uh, Electrons usually uh, some sort of diffuse gas or something, whatever matter you have in your system, it determines uh, the geometry of the space time. Uh, so, this is general relativity. Uh, and then the other uh, sort of domain of physics that we have, I guess, is uh, quantum theory. Uh, quantum field theory describes how quantum fields matter, interact, uh, how fields interact with each other, and how they propagate on a given space time. So they don't tell it, quantum field theory itself doesn't tell us anything about uh, curvature of space time and everything. It just says, once you have a space time, how do fields interact on that space time? Um, so the problem of quantum gravity is to basically merge these things. So uh, how does the quantum matter affect the uh, space time curvature? So uh, basically, what is the quantum version of the right-hand side of Einstein's equations look like? And so of course there are, a bunch of different approaches to this problem. Uh, one of the approaches is just direct quantization. By that, I mean, you just take the gravitational field and you quantize it as though it's uh, you know, the electric field or some other kind of matter field. You just try to do the same thing that we did with all the other fields. Uh, string theory, uh, you, know, you, you have some, uh, basically just a modification of, of something like quantum field theory. More complicated, you have sort of extended objects instead of uh, sort of particles. We won't really talk about any of that. Loop quantum gravity is another thing people talk about, which I don't know much about. Uh, and then another idea is that uh, uh, gravity is just not the type of thing that is a quantum object. It's an emergent object, and it's not something that should be quantized at all. Um, so some of the problems with the other things, uh, direct uh, quantization of the gravitational field gives you something that's non-renormalizable. Uh, uh, meaning it doesn't have a UV completion, meaning it doesn't work at all energy scales. Uh, so we feel like whatever, you know, fundamental theory is should have a UV completion. Uh, string theory, I'll say it's not phenomenologically viable. By that I mean, I think it provably is inconsistent with the standard model as it exists now. Uh, it's only consistent if you include like supersymmetry and things like that. Uh, Loop quantum gravity is just kind of weird. I don't, I don't really know anything about it. And I don't think people take it too seriously in terms of, uh, it suffers from some of the same problems as like theory. Like it just doesn't connect with the, this, uh, 
the full standard model that we, that we know we have. And then emergent gravity is cool. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's based on this idea that, yeah, gravity is not fundamental. Like I said, it's, it's, it sort of emerges from, uh, you know, it's, it's describing relationships between macroscopic properties of a more fundamental system. Uh, in that sense, it's only effective. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Freeman Dyson once said about quantum gravity that it might have just been foolish to try and treat gravity as a, you know, a quantum phenomenon all along, because if it's something that's emergent, like a temperature, it would be foolish to sort of try and quantize temperature. It's just not, it's just not that kind of object. Your gravity might be like that. Okay, so I'll say a few things, just what I mean by emergence in general. I'll give two sort of simple examples where something related to uh, uh, space time emerges, arrow of time from sort of statistical considerations. Um, and then I'll talk about how like thermodynamics comes from statistical mechanics. I'm not gonna give really any details, uh, sort of math details of these derivations. I'll just uh, give you the general sort of arguments. Uh, how you get one together. Uh, I'll talk about black hole thermodynamics, which is the idea that specifically the physics of black holes is analogous to, to classical thermodynamics. I'll talk about the holographic principle, which is uh, uh, just sort of a, a broader idea about how uh, uh, dynamics in space-time are related to dynamics in a, in a quantum theory. And then holographic duality, which is a specific example relating quantum gravity in a specific space-time uh, to a specific quantum field theory without gravity. Um, and this is the sort of the most mathematically rigorous aspect of, of uh, holography um, or sort of emergence where we can actually compute like what gravitational things uh, or how gravitational things are related to quantum things. Uh, we'll talk about that last. Okay. So just what do I mean by emergence? Uh, so a super simple example of how uh, an arrow of time emerges. This is an example that Leonard Susskind loves to talk about in basically every talk he's ever given, uh, which is uh, you consider that you have sort of two attached boxes and you have a gas. Uh, you're given a snapshot, I guess, of, of a gas that's sort of halfway in between the small box and the big box. And the question is, uh, can you answer the question like, did the gas start from the small box and go into the big box? It seems like from our intuition, we'd say, yeah, it looks like you know the gas started in the small thing and sort of spread out into the, into the larger area. Um, but in order to, so, so it turns out we can't actually like make that assumption unless we do something like add a hole of the box where things can escape. So I'll kind of explain what I, what I mean here. So there's two cases. Uh, one, we're given a snapshot of the system. There's no hole. We just have the two attached boxes. The second case is uh, we have the two attached boxes and, and gas can escape on the, on the far right hand side. So yeah, our question to the gas leaking into the big box. The box. And then equivalently, uh, was it in the little box before this moment? So this sort of means, is there a motion of before? And so in the first case, there's no hole. Uh, the, you sort of work from the principles of like statistical mechanics to say every arrangement of particles is equally likely. Um, there's no sort of physical principle that distinguishes between them, assuming it's a closed system and there's, there's no external forces or anything. Um, and just the property of these kind of systems is that they'll pass through every arrangement available in a long enough period of time. So if you're given a snapshot of like what the particles look like at a specific instant, you can't say what, uh, you know, what they looked like at an earlier time because it's equally likely that it was in any other arrangement because the system will pass through all of them. Um, so you really can't say anything about the evolutionary history. Uh, yeah. There are more states that we can have big box yeah, you could say it's more likely that it was in that state than another state. Yeah. Uh, but you can't say that, uh, uh, you can't say whether it was in that state before or after. There's sort of no notion of, uh, of uh, so like at, at the microscopic level, every microstate is as equal as every other microstate. Uh, as probable as every other microstate. Right? Well, you do experiment with the Yeah, so, so, but if you're just given a snapshot of, you, know, you have this one image and you say, is it more like, uh, uh, you'd say it's equally probable that it's in this state as it is in every other state. 
So there, there's not more you can say than that without knowing some extra dynamical principle. Uh, so the second case gives us something that will allow us to answer this question, which is uh, if gas can escape, then you can say it's less likely that the gas will have sort of gone through all possible configurations and then sort of spontaneously come back into this configuration. So maybe maybe the way to answer your question is like, it's a, it's a, you can't rule out that the gas just sort of bounced around and randomly ended up active because that's equally probable as it have starting the small box and coming out. Yeah. Um, in this case, you can rule that out because if it had spread out, the gas would have escaped, but it didn't because it's all right there. So sort of uh, allowing yourself to do an irreversible process gives you a direct enough time. Um, so this is not anything super fundamental or, or new. This is just saying uh, processes that are irreversible increase you know, the entropy. And uh, you can think about that as giving you a direction of evolution. Um, OK, so this it's one way of seeing how some sort of dynamical rule emerges from uh, uh, you know, microscopic entries. Uh, the other main thing that we should talk about it from as uh, emergence is thermodynamics from statistical mechanics. Uh, so the inputs of statistical mechanics are really just sort of what I said before, that every arrangement of particle positions and momenta are equally likely. Um, um, and the dynamics of the particles are determined by like Newton's laws. And then you have the rules of probability. And uh, I won't go into much more detail than that. And, and then what we do is we use macroscopic quantities to characterize the system without knowing about the microstates. So we say, okay, forget about the position of momentum of all the particles. Let's just talk about the total energy of the system, uh, the temperature of the system, something like the average kinetic energy of the particles moving around, uh, the entropy, so the number of microstates that correspond to a given energy, uh, pressure, volume, et cetera, things that don't care about the individual positions. And uh, you sort of make some statistical arguments uh, Concerning the microscopic dynamics, and what you find are some rules about how the uh, the macroscopic quantities are related to each other. Uh, we call those the, the first law of thermodynamics: is that changes in entropy are related. Uh, sorry, changes in energy are related to changes in entropy and volume and, and, and so on. And the second law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of, of the system uh, or of the universe, uh, including everything, will, can only increase and so on. So. Uh, the, so the, the details of how you get here are not important. I just want to point out that you can get rules relating micro, uh, macroscopic quantities uh, sort of emerging from microscopic dynamics. And so that's what I mean by emergence and I'll sort of try and get some somewhat flimsy arguments that gravity is the same way. Flimsy because not because the arguments that uh, people have given historically are flimsy, flimsy because uh, it's hard to kind of condense those down into, into something palatable in this context. But, uh, okay, so I'll talk about three things that sort of are, are, are somewhat different but point towards the same uh, conclusion that gravity is is emergent in this kind of way. Um, the first, black hole thermodynamics. The second, uh, holographic principle and the holographic reality, which is sort of a specific instantiation of the holographic principle. And I'll explain what this is. So let's first talk about black hole thermodynamics. So some simple <laughs> and basic facts about black holes. Uh, they are completely determined by their mass, their angular momentum, and their charge. What I mean by that is that the entire space-time geometry depends on only those parameters, the mass of the black hole, their charge, and, their, and how fast they're rotating, their angular momentum. Um, that means um, there's the only free parameters that show up in Einstein's equations. Uh, okay, so that's one fact. So, so I guess that sort of means that there, there's not a lot of wiggle room for you know uh, anything uh, microscopic. Uh, you can't know much microscopic detail about a black hole. It just doesn't depend at all on what the particles are doing inside the, the horizon or anything. Like that. It just depends on their total mass. Um, okay, another fact about black holes is that their area is proportional to the mass squared. Basically, you can think of like the short child radius is proportional to the mass, and the area is proportional to the radius squared. So uh, that's a fact we'll use. And then another fact is the, the Hawking area theorem, which proved classically that uh, any dynamical process, meaning sort of any interaction of the black hole with stuff outside the black hole, will cause the area to increase. Um, 
we know that sort of just a classical result because of Hawking later proved that uh, with quantum effects they evaporate, and of course they're area shrinks when they evaporate. But ignoring quantum effects, just purely classically, uh, black hole areas can only increase. And uh, maybe you could think about that that as being sort of reminiscent of something like the second law of thermodynamics. Um, we'll, we'll sort of expand on that analogy. Okay, so so here's a thought experiment that uh, this guy Beckenstein used to used to do or used to think about. Uh, so you uh, you have a box of matter with some entropy, S matter. Uh, you throw the box into the black hole. Uh, the box is sort of not there anymore. Um, the black hole sort of just scrambles. It doesn't care about its macroscopic details anymore at all because it, uh, the black hole is purely described by its the mass and charge. So it just doesn't say anything about the matter, um, or at least about the, the entropy. Um, and so the entropy has somehow decreased because you had some matter, some entropy, uh, in the matter that you threw in and that entropy is gone. And so you're very sad because the second law of thermodynamics is violated. Um, and so Beckenstein says, well, obviously the black hole just has the entropy. So, you know, the entropy of the universe really increases, right? And Simplicio says, Beckenstein, uh, <laughs> you fool. This conflicts with the fact that the black hole geometry is completely determined by MJ and Q. There's just no way to account for the uh, for the entropy because the entropy of the black hole uh, requires knowing at least something more than just the mass and the angular momentum. Uh, and so Beckenstein's answer is that well, okay, that's correct, uh, but there is a quantity which always increases under dynamical processes, and that's the area. And so we can at least say that the area increases. And so maybe the area is somehow keeping track of the entropy. Um, that's really the only way out of this problem that the second law of thermodynamics is violated, that somehow the area has to compensate. Um, and of course, uh, the guy he's arguing with is mad that uh, he found a resolution. Okay, so the resolution is, yeah, the area, uh, the entropy of the black hole is uh, related to the area, yeah. Is this like only classical? Yeah, this is purely classical. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good, an important uh, point. So, um, so anyway, so yeah, we assume that the, uh, the entropy of the black hole is proportional to the area with some proportionality constant that you would compute by, by requiring that it, you know, uh, upholds the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, he didn't know what it was at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the area increases, like that's just a purely like a GR result that under any any physical process, the area can only increase. It really just comes down to the fact that things can go into a black hole and can come out faster. Um, okay, so people really did not take this idea seriously when he came up with it because they're like, okay, it makes sense, like the argument, but there's really no evidence for it outside of these sort of thought experiments. Um, just to draw a little picture here of, of what the setup was, you throw some matter in, it increases the area, uh, and we say the change in the, uh, the entropy of the outside plus the area is uh, you know minus the change in uh, entropy on the outside, so negative S matter plus the change in area, and you're going to require that that thing's positive, and so that means that the change in area has to be greater than whatever the entropy of the matter you threw in. Yeah. Why is there uh, well, because we, we posture, because areas, that, so, so you could say, yeah. So in simple geometries, the area is proportional to the mass squared. If you have charge and angular momentum, that's not exactly true. Okay. It's proportional to some combination of those. Yeah. So that was yeah, a detail I, I sort of ignored. Okay, so we can make an analogy with thermodynamics in this simple case where the area depends only on the mass, like a Schwarzschild black hole. Um, so you take the energy of the black hole to be proportional to the mass, with some proportionality constant I call alpha. Uh, think E equals mc squared, E is proportional to that. So we say the energy of the black hole is just m. Uh, you take the entropy to be proportional to the area, which is proportional to m squared, with some constant beta. And you take derivatives 
And you see that you can get an equation that looks sort of similar to first law of thermodynamics, change in E is related to change in S by some constant T, which in T just from, from uh, how we define E and B, how it had to be alpha over beta times one over N. So you see that uh, by calling entropy the area, uh, it sort of, and making an analogy with thermodynamics, it sort of predicts that there's a temperature that goes like one over the uh, So this is something that, that Beckenstein knew back in the day, but nobody cared about. Because uh, you can't, this sort of as far as you can take this argument. But of course, Hawking would later calculate quantum effects uh, uh, for fields near a black hole and would find that uh, black holes do radiate and they radiate at a particular temperature called the Hawking temperature. And it just turns out that in all the cases where you can, where you actually know what these proportionality constants alpha and beta are for uh, relating the, the entropy to the area and the energy to the mass, the Hawking temperature agrees exactly with what Beckenstein calculated by just making an analogy with the thermodynamics. So I think this sort of uh, made people really take these ideas much more seriously that uh, somehow, the classical arguments for GR knew something about the quantum effects on the black hole background. Uh, you could sort of predict that they had a temperature uh, without knowing anything about quantum mechanics. Uh, and that's kind of strange. I, I think it's still kind of an unanswered question of like how, you know, it's just sort of a coincidence, I guess. It's a hint at something deeper. Really what it's a hint at is that uh, black hole dynamics there were, and the laws that govern them are secretly you know, thermodynamical, uh, uh, they emerge from the yeah. Does this imply that thermodynamics, especially with are somehow connected to quantum mechanics? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Your uh, question was Yeah, so the question was uh, Does this actually tell us uh, that uh, the laws of black holes are related to sort of the quantum mechanics of black holes, this analogy. Um, and the answer is that this argument itself doesn't really show that, but there are other things that point to the same thing. So we think that this does imply that, because there are other reasons to also believe it. Yeah, okay, so there's two questions you could ask. So we'll, I'll sort of change gears here a little bit and talk, talk about um, something that came a little later, so the holographic principle, which is sort of a more general uh, You know, consequence of, of these ideas and ideas like those, which I won't go into too much detail about. Um, you could ask two questions. So, if the area of the black hole horizon is really an entropy, what is it the entropy of? Uh, so, what are the sort of microscopic things that uh, it's talking about? It's a macroscopic property of what system? Uh, and then, what's special about black hole horizons? Why can't we just say something like this about every surface? Like, uh, you know, what's the difference between the black hole horizon and just, you know, a sphere with some surface area in, in, in space? Um, and sorry, there's kind of a lot on this slide, but we'll go through, through uh, step by step. So we have sort of another thought experiment. Um, these were the sort of thought experiments done by like Leonard Susskind and uh, I think Tuft and uh, later like uh, Raphael Bousseau. Yeah. So imagine you start with just some arbitrary surface with some area A and you start putting matter into it, matter with some entropy, on the interior of the surface. Uh, nothing happens. You just put more and more matter on the inside, and that's it. Um, but eventually, what will happen is if you, you keep putting more and more matter and sort of compressing it into the inside of the surface, eventually, its mass will become so large that it's equal to the mass of a black hole with that area at which point you can no longer add more mass to it without increasing the size, increasing the size of the, the area. This is the hopping area here. Um, so do a little picture. You're putting matter into some region. Eventually you cross the threshold where uh, that matter becomes a black hole of the size of that area, at which point you can no longer put any more matter in without expanding the area. So what that tells us is that general surfaces tell us about the maximum amount of matter that can be put inside of them. Um, so somehow areas in general are bounding the amount of entropy contained in a region. So there's a, 
you know, there, there are this argument and, and others that seem to imply that in general, surface areas are related to, to entropies. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just um, kind of this background. Um, I know it's black hole. Uh, is there any relationship to that surface area? Yeah, I mean the surface area of the event horizon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk about their volumes, I guess, a little later. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess the reason that areas ended up being important is because of the Hawking area theorem. You know, it just sort of happens that the, the thing that always increased under dynamical process was the surface area and not something else. Um, you know, if you had said their volumes increased, we would have probably just made the same analogy with entropies and volumes. Okay. So yeah, the area of, so the answer to these questions is, yeah, the area measures the entropy of the matter contained within it. Uh, sorry, the area of a black hole horizon measures the entropy of the matter inside of it. Uh, and then the area of a general surface tells, about, tells us about the maximum amount of entropy <coughs> and matter that you could place inside of it. Uh, so somehow, uh, you know, there are, there are much more robust arguments and examples that lead to a sort of general holographic principle, principle which says that surfaces encode information about the matter enclosed. Um, there's a lot more to say about this that uh, I won't say, but I, I think uh, talking about the holographic duality will give us some, some, you know, some, more, some more details to actually think about. Um, but yeah, lots of people have arrived at this sort of holographic principle for many different routes. This is just the sort of the simplest route I could. Okay, yeah, the serious stuff. Uh, this is uh, holographic duality. This is the ADS CFT uh, correspondence, which I will talk about in basically no detail, but I'll just sort of give you the important points about the relationship between quantum stuff and geometric stuff. Uh, so Mel Vicenna proved late 90s that there's this mathematical equivalence between two, two different kinds of theories. One of those theories is, is quantum gravity and d-dimensional asymptotically anti space spacetimes. And the other thing is conformal field theory and d minus one dimensional spacetimes. And I'll talk about you know, what the heck that means. Uh, so uh, ADS spacetime is just a type of spacetime with a negative cosmological constant. It's a space time which has a reachable boundary. So it's not like, uh, it's not like our space time. Our space time has like a, a cosmological horizon, but you could go past it in principle. There's no like boundary of the universe. So ADS has a boundary. Um, quantum gravity in ADS, I just mean that whatever the gravitational field is, it's like a quantum field. So I said there were problems with doing quantum gravity, non-renormalizability and stuff like that. It's okay in this kind of space time, at least, uh, but pretend it's okay. So, so that's what, what sort of we mean by you know, ADS quantum gravity. It's a particular type of quantum gravity in a particular space time. Details more than that are not super important. Um, the CFT that it's dual to is just a type of quantum field theory without gravity, meaning it's just a quantum system uh, living in some space time of its own that doesn't have gravity. So no, no. Uh, no space-time curvature in general. And so what the ads cfg correspondent says is, is that uh, the space-time theory, which we call the bulk theory, and I'll, I'll show a picture to sort of hopefully make this clear. We call the bulk theory, it's the, you know, it's the region inside the space-time. It's related to a conformal field theory living on the boundary. We call that conformal field theory the quantum theory, the fundamental theory. And the ads cfg dictionary just equates objects between the two theories. It's a, it's a duality. It's a mathematical equivalent between the two theories. Yeah. So, with ADS space time, don't we have uh, negative cosmological constant, or does it have to be negatively curved? Uh, yeah, it has to be negatively curved. It's asymptotically ADS, which means, yeah, it, it approaches exactly ADS at, at the boundary. So, yeah, it's good. Asymptotically, ADS allows for us to put mass into it, basically. Like, it can not be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to have a constant uh, curvature, but near the boundary, it's, it's uh, curvature is just that. Okay, so here's the picture. 
just anti sitter space. People usually draw this picture of uh, this sort of a uh, Penrose tessellation or something. It just means that if you're looking at sort of a slice of the space time, just like a, you know, a, uh, an instant of time, you sort of tessellate it with uh, uh, tiles that all have the same size. And as you go towards the, the boundary of the space time, uh, you can fit more and more tiles in it. So like it's, uh, imagine that all these tiles are the same size. This is how you smush the, rep the, the space time and represent them in, in our space time. Sort of. So like if you were living in that world, you'd have to go infinitely far across infinitely many tiles to get to the boundary, but it's still like, it has a finite size in some sense. I think the, the details are not super important. I just want to at least uh, put that there. So uh, for example, in these space times, or if you put time moving upwards and you have a bunch of different sort of uh, uh, instance of time stacked on top of each other, a photon could like go to the boundary and bounce back off and come back into the interior. So that's the kind of space time this is. Uh, conformal field theories are basically just quantum field theories that are extra symmetric. They're symmetric under rotations, under Lorentz boosts, and under scale transformations, and they're to draw scale transformations. And the fields are like invariant under transformation. So, in some sense, this model is like it's not a very realistic model, of a universe or our universe, right? Because our universe is not like super, uh, I don't want to use the word super symmetric, it's not uh, specifically symmetric in this way. And, uh, and our universe doesn't have a boundary and so on. But anyway, uh, we usually draw a picture like this. We, we consider we have. A d dimensional space time. So the duality relates, this is the sort of important part. It relates d dimensional uh, ABS quantum gravity to d minus one dimensional conformal field theory. So if you think about a surface as one dimension lower than, than the uh, sort of space, the region inside of it, right? Um, so we normally think about this duality as relating objects on the interior of the space time to objects on the boundary of the space time. That's relevant because when we talked about the holographic principle and, and black holes, we said that the area of the black hole is related to the amount of matter on the inside. So this is sort of this, this duality between d-dimensional uh, ADS quantum gravity and d-minus one dimensional, dimensional form of field theory is a similar kind of relationship between interior and exterior. Gravity and something without gravity. And, uh, so this picture, of, I'm trying to draw like the theory living on the boundary because it's on space time and uh, it's T minus one dimensions. And we normally just draw it as yeah, a picture like this, like the CFT is on the boundary and the ADS is on the bulk. Okay, so what does the duality tell us? This is a bunch of sort of technical words that are really not important. Uh, it equates reduced density matrices in the two theories. Uh, it equates the partition functions of the two theories. It equates asymptotic operators in the bulk with operators on the boundary, the gravitational couplings with the number of boundary fields, et cetera. There's a lot of just equivalencies between things. Like it maps objects in one theory to objects in the other. Those are all not super important. Uh, so what I mean is you have these two theories, you have objects in each of them that are related to each other. Relate quantum states, relate the Hamiltonian, relate the partition function, relate gravitational coupling constants. Uh, you can relate, so so for example, you can relate uh, Newton's constant in the gravitational theory to the number of quantum fields in the, in the conformal field theory. So the duality, the dictionary they call it relates different objects. Uh, but there's two relations that are the most important with respect to like uh, space time as being emergent. Um, and those are uh, these that, um, the, something called the boundary entanglement entropy is equal to the area of surfaces in the bulk. And I'll draw pictures and describe what these mean momentarily. Uh, the other one is that the computational complexity of states on the boundary, a quantum thing, is related to the volume of slices of, of surfaces uh, in the bulk. So the second one is, is uh, people disagree about how to do it correctly. And most of my research is sort of on the second thing that we're talking about that more. Okay, so here's how this duality works. You take a quantum state on the boundary, on a region of the boundary. So we'll go back and forth between this picture and the previous slide. You take a quantum state 
on some region of the battery. So that's where this is a statement about the just the quantum theory without gravity living on the battery. You take the quantum state on some region. Uh, you find a surface through the bulb, which is connected to the boundary region. And you find this, the surface which has the maximal area, or I'm sorry, the minimum area. So, so we have the, uh, the quantum state of the boundary. We have surfaces through the interior geometry, through the bulk, where we have quantum gravity. You take surfaces. You look at all of the possible surfaces sort of connected to the boundary region, and you find the one with the minimal surface area. And uh, the duality tells you that the entropy of this quantum state is equal to the area of the minimal area surface. Um, so what that means is that this uh, quantum mechanical object in the theory without gravity is measuring the area of specific surfaces in the geometry. So somehow the geometry itself is really secretly uh, uh, quantum information theoretical. Yeah. That's a good question. It really just uh, comes out of doing path and rules and the details of the duality. Yeah, it's a uh, question. Uh, the question was why is it minimal? Um, and the answer is just that it is. That's what the math says. Yeah. Uh, there are like two of these. Yeah, yeah. So you would find this minimal surface by solving something like a geodesic equation or something analogous. Yeah. Yeah. Is like an arc on the circle like a state? Is an arc on the or circle? Is it a set of states? Okay, so so what I mean is you have a quantum state in the boundary theory. Um, you could have many different quantum states, but I'll, I'll say assume the boundary is in a particular state, and then we'll look at just the state that's on that region. And uh, the entanglement entropy of that state is related to the area of the surface. Um, and I have some slides talking about like what entanglement entropy is and what computational complexity is, but uh, I don't know that we'll have time to get to them, but I have them at the end. If we have time, we can talk about them. Um, the important point is just that uh, the duality relates surface areas in the quantum gravity uh, theory to entropy in the quantum theory in a very sort of specific way. Okay, so I'll talk about the other uh, geometric uh, duality, which again, I said, said is kind of debated, the details are debated, but I think some version of this duality is believed to be true. Uh, so we do a similar thing. So we take some region of the boundary theory and some quantum state on that region, row A, uh, and we compute something called the computational complexity of that state. It's just some, some quantum mechanical property of that state. Uh, we find the minimal surface that we found before. So we have the state, we, compute, we, we find this surface, and then we're gonna fill in this region with, uh, with a volume. So actually, I'm trying to draw it here. So we uh, take the region, find the minimal surface, fill it in, and there are a bunch of different ways we could fill it in. So if you sort of look at the side view, you can fill it in with a surface that sort of goes down, a surface that goes up and is wiggly, or you can fill it in with some surface that's you know smooth. You find you you sort of look at all possible ways of filling it in, compute their volumes, and you'll find one that has a maximal volume. There's sort of a maximal way of filling it in, and the duality tells you that the computational complexity of the state, some some property of the of the quantum state, is is equal to the the volume of the maximal slice. Um, so it's just sort of another example, I guess, of a, a geometric object in the quantum gravity theory that is computable by just do by just looking at the quantum state that it's doable to it and computing its complexity. Uh, complexity is kind of analogous to entropy. It's uh, maybe I'll save it. It isn't one. Yeah, I'm just I'm confused why you can't just draw like a huge bubble. Like, why is it kind of be like you have these nice little like kind of but I mean, a maximal volume could be like a huge bubble. That's like yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good question. So really, time is going upward in this picture, and you could think as surfaces get more and more, uh, uh, as as they evolve more and more into the future, they become closer and closer to being like null, uh, meaning. In the same direction that a light ray would travel, so light rays sort of travel at forty five degree angles, and the length of path, the, the the length 
of light like trajectories is zero. So actually, like as you go further and further up, the volume gets smaller and smaller, which is just kind of a weird property of this particular geometry. Yeah. And and so you might say, well, does does this make sense in other geometries? Then, like it seems like a very specific geometry where this makes sense. And the answer is that, well, yeah, it only makes sense in this geometry. Maybe <laughs> it's just not something that's true in general. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So if you have uh, like what they call a vacuum ADS, so ADS with nothing in it, then the maximum volume slice is just the one that's like flat. Because as you go towards the future or the past, it gets closer to being normal, and it's uh, time time symmetric. But in general, remember this ADS space time is just asymptotically ADS. So you can have matter, and that will if there's say there's a black hole in the space time that will affect what the, the curvature looks like. Okay. So the point of all of that, the, like I said, details being somewhat unimportant. The point is you can relate geometric objects in this specific set of theories, anti de Sitter phase, quantum gravity, and quantum field theory. You can relate uh, geometric objects to things that are purely quantum mechanical. Um, so in some sense, it gives us an explicit example of the holographic principle being realized. Where, so we sort of had general arguments well before the, the in, uh, invention of holographic duality that somehow areas were related to entropies classically. And, uh, and uh, now we have from just a completely different avenue, uh, a mathematical equivalence between a set of theories where, where that duality is actually true. Um, Okay, so um, let's see. How much time? Eight minutes. Okay. So I'll talk about one other aspect of things you can get from this duality, which I think is interesting. Um, it's a little more technical, but the conclusion is kind of cool. So entanglement entropies are just sort of a quantum generalization of, of entropy. Um, that's the thing that's related to surface areas in this in this uh, ADS CFT duality. Um, there's equivalently, in the way that there's a first law of thermodynamics, there's a first law of entanglement entropies that tells you how variations in entropy are related to variations in area in the quantum theory and just the CFT. Um, so just totally just irrespective of gravity, any CFT will have this property. Variations in entropy are related to variations in the, in the energy. Um, the bulk dual, so if you took this equation and asked what the the uh, the bulk dual under the ADS-CFT map is to that equation, it's Einstein's equations. Um, and I'll kind of try and explain how that works very pictorially. So variations in the, so let's look at just the left-hand side. Variations in the entanglement entropy, I said, so I said entanglement entropy is related to the area of specific surfaces. So variations in the entanglement entropy is related to variations in surfaces in the bulk. Variations in surfaces in the bulk geometry is related to things that have to do with curvature, like the, the curvature tensor and space time metric and geometric objects. And so, this sort of combination of things is what shows up on the left hand side of Einstein's equations, right? the, the geometric parts. If you look at the right hand side of the equation, we are varying the energy in the CFT. Um, variations, in, variations in energy in the CFT are related to variations in energy in the bulk. This is just from the duality. It tells us that the energies are related to each other. And then variations in the energy in, in a, any gravitational theory are related to the stress tensor, the, the amount of matter in the theory. And that's the right-hand side of Einstein's equations. So, um, you know, you go through the details of, you know, sort of doing the variations on either side, and you see that the whole dual of the, the sort of first law of entanglement entropy, the quantum equivalent of the first law of thermodynamics, uh, is precisely Einstein's equations in the gravity theory. Um, so what that says is that, like, not is it? It's not only just that like volumes and areas are related to quantum mechanical objects. It's that Einstein's equations themselves are really just a sort of complicated way, in some sense, of rewriting thermodynamic relations in the quantum theory. Yeah. 
Delta H. Delta H. So H plutonium variations in the in the energy. Incidentally, people, so, so this relationship between uh, uh, thermodynamical, so uh, first law of thermodynamics and Einstein's equations is actually something that people derived classically long ago. Uh, Jacob Beckenstein, I think in the 90s, showed that if you just take the sort of original analogy when I had the black hole thermodynamics, if you just take that analogy and assume that it's true for arbitrary surfaces instead of just black hole surfaces, you say, oh, assume that uh, every surface is analogous to thermodynamics. Uh, the consequence of that assumption is Einstein's equations. Um, that's just a purely classical result too. So this, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think the combination of those things is you know, a pretty strong indication that uh, whatever gravity is, it's, it's secretly just a relationship between like macroscopic objects. It's really what you might call like an equation of state. Like, uh, it's like talking about P and D and, and thermodynamics. Uh, uh, not at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that's the big wrinkle in all this. So, so I should say the other stuff, like the holographic principle and uh, black hole thermodynamics, all of, and Einstein's equations coming from from uh, black hole thermodynamics and stuff. Like that all has nothing to do with ADS space. And that's just true in general. Um, this specific example where we can actually compute, like we can actually like directly relate uh, geometric objects and quantum objects, that's only, that only works in ADS. And there's a lot of good reason to believe that that just won't work outside of ADS. People kind of hope that it will, and there are arguments that it should work in theory, in like two dimensional theories. Um, but uh, in general, there's not a lot of evidence of Questions. Yeah. Where did we get like ADS from? Like, was basically was ADS invented to solve this problem? No, ADS was a particular type of space time that's been around since like the sixties, I think. So okay. it just happened to be one that was related to the theory. But yeah, something that was not. And is it the case that we can only compute these things with ADS, but then no other types of space times, and that's why we're hopeful? Or is it that like? No, it's that. So Malthusian approved this duality. It's that that duality is only provable between ADS and, yeah. and filter. Yeah, there is not a duality for other types of space time. Yeah. Yeah. Are black holes ADS space time? You can have black holes in an ADS space time, but ADS sort of describes the, the structure of the universe rather than like, uh, you know, a black hole in the middle of it. it describes the asymptotic. Yeah. What's like the biggest divergence between ADS space time and black hole space time? Um, so ADS space-time is negatively curved, which means it has a reachable boundary. Uh, a universe like ours is presumably positively curved and is expanding and has no boundary. So, so it's like, it's like, issue, like, unresolved, like, decision on, like, how long boundary is. Yeah, because it, in some sense, like, it, it is okay that there's a holographic principle here because there's a boundary for, a, there's a place for the dual theory to live. Um, in a universe like ours, you have to answer the question of what, where's the boundary degrees of freedom? Where, yeah. Um, okay, so I had some slides that were just to recap, but I think maybe since we're basically out of time, we can just skip them. We talked about uh, emergence, thermodynamics, and statistical mechanics, black hole thermodynamics as being you know, uh, an example of macroscopic uh, properties, you know, sort of emerging from microscopic properties. Talk about holographic principle, areas related to entropies, and then uh, ADS safety. Yeah. Question from the chat Is this similar to the variational principle in the secular equation? In which equation? Secular? Similar to the variational principle and the secular equation. The secular, I don't know. I don't know. That's a chemistry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No idea. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, 
I, it depends on who you ask. I think some people think it's just a technical problem. Um, so for example, like the arguments from earlier in the talk, like the holographic principle and black hole thermodynamics, all that has nothing to do with ADS. And so you, we sort of take that as thinking, as, as indicating that something like holographic gravity is just true in general. Uh, we just don't know how to do it for other, other space times. Um, some people, particularly like a lot of strength theorists. Uh, so ADS-CP comes out of strength theory. Uh, some people think that, I think for good reasons, it's just mathematically not possible to have it in, in any other space time. And uh, in which case, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Seems like something that should be true in general because there are other arguments for it, but uh, yeah, open question. We have more time for questions, but can we at least just thank our speaker and open up the okay. direction? Thanks. <laughs>